Outside. I had to break out the boots and I'm telling you, it's cold in here. We have the no touch. Okay. All right. It'll warm up. I'll be preaching here in a minute. So <laughs> a lot of hot air coming. <laughs> Let us now transition into a time of reverent praise and thanksgiving to Almighty God in this hour as we come together as a church family to pray. Let us bow together. Heavenly Father, we gather this day to worship you and to offer you our praise as we begin to see the signs of the seasons changing. Through the warmth of the days, may we be reminded of your love for each one of us. As the changing colors of the season happened, may we be reminded of the diversity of your world. As crops ripen and prepare for harvest, may we be reminded of your provision for us day by day. Open our hearts and still our minds this morning to receive your word to us. Stir our imaginations and move us into action as we pledge to pass on the gift of hope for the world through our daily living and in the legacy that we leave for future generations. We acknowledge and ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who offered a prayer that we say together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let me invite you to participate in the responsive reading. 
It's listed in your bulletin. I'll be reading the regular font, and if you would read the boldface font in response. Because the Lord is righteous and good, he teaches sinners the path they should follow. With faithfulness and love, he leads all who keep his covenant and obey his commands. Keep your promise, Lord, and forgive my sins, for they are many. Those who have reverence for the Lord will learn from him the path they should follow. Reverence to me, Lord, and be merciful to me, because I am lovely and weak. Relieve me of my worries and save me from all my troubles. Protect me and save me. Keep me from defeat. I come to you for safety. May my goodness and honesty preserve me, because I trust in you. And now I'll invite you to turn to uh, the hymn book, the white book in front of you in the pews, or if you're in the front pew uh, underneath you. Uh, we're going to sing the hymn of praise, 223, Nothing But the Blood. Uh, let's stand and sing together. First scripture lesson comes from Isaiah chapter 64. It's located on in your pew Bible on page 1163. Uh, my Bible is in my pew, but my eyes are not quite as good as they used to be, so I want to read it from a little bit larger font. <clears throat> oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze 
and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you were angry. How can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags, and shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold on you. We all, we all are the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are your people. You sac your sacred cities have become a wasteland. Even Zion is a wasteland. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and glorious temple where our ancestors praised you has been burned with fire, and all that we treasure lies in ruins. All of this, Lord, we hold yourself back. Will you keep silent and punish us beyond measure? Thanks be to God for the words of God. I have a treat for the kids this morning. It is not Jeffrey and Lisa this morning. I'd like to invite all the children down for children's sermon time with our deacon Edith Kennedy. Really appreciate those are the things that are good for you. 
They make sure they have things in the house for you to eat. They make sure the house is warm and chilly days. So they take care of you. But as Tilly said, there's somebody else that wants you that way. I don't know. Who did you say, Tilly? Did you say, did you say Jesus? Well, somebody said it. Um, you know what I mean? That's a good thought. Because what I wanted to talk to you about today is God is loving. And just like your parents take care of you, and that's the way you know they love you, God takes care of you too. Who made the world? God. God did. And God did it. He created people last. So he put dry land and sunshine and vegetables to eat before he put you here. He planned all of that out so that the world would be here for you to live in. And the other thing that God did, he put you in families that love you. The mom and dad love you. And you can thank God for that too. Right? So I have a little gift for you, Chuckie. This is from the wordless Bible because I have some of you can't read. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give each of you one of these. And inside of it, a little message. Okay? So when you get these, I want you to give them, show them, they yours to keep. I want you to show them to your mom and dad, and they'll talk to you a little bit more about all the different colors of things in here. But right now, when you see this, you remember God loves you and so do you think. So let's have a prayer. And what I'd like you to do is I'm going to say something and I want you to repeat it out. Dear God, Dear God, we thank you so much that you love us. We thank you so much that you love us. Thank you for creating the world for us. Thank you for creating the world for us. And thank you for giving us parents who love us. Thank you for giving us parents who love us. And thank you for helping Pastor Mark be okay after the service. Amen. Amen. Now, don't go right off. I'm going to give you these, and if you don't sit on this front pew, because we're going to have a promotion Sunday before you go to the class. Okay? So, that's why I give you these. And Brenda Knighton, who is our Sunday School Director, will uh, explain the promotion. Good morning. I'm not going to do a specific uh, promotion necessarily, but I did want to just kind of talk about uh, Sunday School in general. If you'll draw your attention to the insert in your um, bulletin this morning, um, there was a great write up about Sunday School, the importance of Sunday School, and why each and every one of us needs Sunday School with Preston. <coughs> Why uh, each person needs some uh, time fellowshipping with other believers and also exchanging ideas. God brings our hearts and our minds when we pray independently and um, by ourselves or in our home or our car, wherever we choose to pray. But He also burdens other uh, hearts and minds with other ideas and other thoughts and things that we should be sharing together collectively as believers. So coming to Sunday school allows us to exchange those ideas to exchange those thoughts, to pray collectively, and to fellowship with other believers. So I highly encourage you to look at the back side and look at the different classes that are offered and try to find one if you're not already participating in a Sunday school class, to find one where you feel you might fit in. And I encourage you to try multiple classes for several weeks in a row to just see if there's one that uh, you might find that uh, connects with you and the individuals that are in that class. For the children, I wanted to just acknowledge each of the children. Some are promoting into the next grade class, and some are staying with their same classroom that they've been in for the past year. And um, also to make a plea. I, I beg you, I plead with you, we need a few more children Sunday school teachers. Um, currently, by default, I'm teaching the youth uh, Sunday school class, which by the way starts at 9.45. So all sixth graders through 12th graders, that is still your Sunday school time. Also, college students that are home uh, from school or if you live and uh, go to school locally, come to the uh, 1824 Sunday school class in conjunction with you, or 
You can start with Mark and Linda um, next Sunday in the 20s and 30s class. Totally up to you. Um, whichever you prefer is great. Just come. Um, so for the children, we are really in the teachers. Uh, um, I'm also picking up the first of the kindergarten through second grade today, and I'm excited to teach third through fifth grade in two months. So kind of stressful little thing here. We really need some help with the children and teachers. The rotations are every two months. There's some material that's offered, and it's a really rewarding experience. These little faces just bring so much joy. And uh, just watching them grow and learn and imparting what you know about Jesus into their hearts for them to hide and to keep uh, as they grow and mature. So right now I want to invite everybody who's three years old to come forward and stand next to me. Is anybody three? Okay, is anybody four? Four-year-olds, come see me. Great. Can you say your name big and loud so everyone can hear? Jay. Jay. Come here, sweetie. What's your name? Say it one more time. Olivia. Olivia. Okay. Very good. Any five-year-olds who are not in kindergarten? Okay. So your teacher today is Mrs. Ann Gray, and she rotates with Brenda Sellers every two months. Okay, Mrs. Gray. All right, guys. You're dismissed to go with your teacher. All right. Kindergarten, Mrs. Come on up. All right. Please turn in your hymnal again to hymn number 56, Immortal, Invisible, God, Only Wise. And let's stand and we'll sing together. Yeah. 
Let us pray together. Almighty Father, we are reminded so often in our Bible studies that you are capable of miraculous actions. But we know now firsthand that your miracles are not limited to these ancient times. People still experience miracles in these ordinary, everyday times. We recall those many miracles that have touched people within our own congregation, even today. We are astounded by these miracles that we witness each day, and we are so very thankful and humbled for them. Today, we give our offering to you as a sacred gesture of our gratitude. It is in your son's name that we do make this prayer. Amen.
Are y'all warming up yet? All right. Our second scripture lesson today comes from the New Testament book of Romans, chapter 3. I'll be reading verses 19 through 26. If you're following along in your pew Bible, turn to 1748. That's the New International Version. Now we know that whatever the Lord says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now apart from the law of righteousness of God, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through the faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left in the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. A teenage boy had just passed his driver's test and inquired of his father as to when they could discuss the use of the car. His father said, I'll make a deal with you, son. You bring your grades up from a C to a B average, you study your Bible a little bit more, and you get your hair cut. And then we'll talk about the car. The boy thought about that for a moment and decided that this was a good deal, so they entered into an agreement. And about six weeks later, the father said, Son, you brought your grades up, and I've observed that you've been reading your Bible so much, but I'm disappointed you haven't had your hair cut yet. What are you waiting for? The boy said, You know, Dad, I've been thinking about that, and I've noticed that in my studies... In the Bible, Samson has long hair, and, and John the Baptist has long hair, and Moses had long hair, and the perception is Jesus had long hair too. And his father replied, did you also notice that they walked wherever they went? <laughs> Every family has its quirks, and you know I'm not talking about my children because their hair is this long. <laughs> Today we are going to be focusing on my family's favorite TV show. Um, the boys and I watch this show. We started watching it three years ago, and we got engrossed in it one night. And in two weeks we binge-watched every single episode. Um, it's a popular TV series now in its third season, starting September 25th, called This Is Us. And it's on NBC. It's been nominated for eight Emmys because of the power in its writing and its acting. And it's literally bought, brought millions of fans to laughter and tears in the same night um, because they see themselves in this story. For those of you unfamiliar, who has seen This Is Us? Everybody watch that? For those of you who have not seen it, it's a story of a family, Jack and Rebecca Pearson. And they have three children. Kate is an overweight girl that often struggles with her self-image because of her weight problem. Her fraternal twin is Kevin, who is a very handsome, very self-absorbed man who is also a famous actor. And Randall, who is a highly brilliant and respectful, dependable black man that the family adopted when he was a baby. And all three of these children were born on the exact same day. So one of the geniuses of the plot 
is that it bounces back and forth between stories while the kids are born, before the kids were born, teenagers, and now as adults. And sometimes the storyline bounces back and forth between the ages in one episode. So you really have to pay attention as to going back and forth. A friend of mine told me how amazed she was that how similar this family was to her own. And in fact, it seems that everybody who becomes a fan of This Is Us says the same thing. This is us. This is me. And they literally see themselves in that show. Now, a little disclaimer here, that is not a Christian show. I have never heard God mentioned or the Bible or any type of church. Very, very rarely. And the actors often use cuss words. And family members struggle with betrayal and anger and resentment, selfishness, just sin. Okay? But the folks in this series, they're not portrayed as devious or nasty or evil. They're just people. And people are trying to get by in this world, and that's what we're attracted to. We're attracted to this show because that's us. We're just trying to get by. And that's what I want to focus on today is this is us. Romans 3.23, I'm going to say this a lot during the next few minutes, is all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Too often churchgoers find themselves as somehow superior to those that are outside of the church. And I don't see that very much here um, in this area, but it does happen. And here, especially in Romans, Paul is trying to get the Christians to understand that as Christians, we are just like everybody else, except for two things. The first major area is we are not like everyone else. Christians tend to live better lives than those who don't have Christ. And I'll get to that in a second, but I want you to know I had the opportunity this past Friday to do a ride along with the town of Haymarket police from 7 in the morning until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And if you've seen me on Facebook, you will see that I was wearing this 20-pound vest with mace and taser and a badge. It was one of the coolest experiences I have ever had in my life, truly. Is that not, how many of you really know me to be in a police car, as frightening as that is? I was waiting for the high speeds, chase down 55. I was so excited when the lights and sirens came on. I was so excited for um, the adrenaline rush of it all. And we had a couple tickets that day and a medical emergency. So it was kind of a down day for me. <laughs> but, but the one thing that struck me through that day was the flat out discrimination that was placed against our officers just because they're officers. They are disliked when they're late. They're disliked when they catch us doing something wrong. They're disliked just because they wear a badge and they're, pol they're the police and they enforce civility and security. The judgment passed against them for absolutely no good reason was disheartening to me. Um, and I witnessed it. And it had me thinking that we do the same thing. How, do we, how often do we scrutinize those that don't come to church? How often do we scrutinize them just for showing up at Easter and Christmas? That, what about those that aren't Christians? What about those that don't add themselves to our church committees right away? A study was done about nine years ago by the University of Chicago, and it found that those that attend church regularly and take part in other religious activities performed an average of 128 acts of kindness over the year versus 96 of those that don't go to church. In other words, spending, according to this, spending time with God in church, Bible study, and personal prayer makes us better people than if we had not been able to do those things. So belonging to Christ gives us a decided advantage over those who aren't Christians. 
But there's a danger here to avoid. The danger is believing that we are better off than others because somehow we are better than other people just because we're Christians. It's the old holier-than-thou syndrome. Now, we are better off than non-Christians, but we have to be careful not to use our righteousness as some kind of yardstick to compare ourselves with others who don't go to church or who aren't Christians. And there's two reasons for that. Is first that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it means that because we have all sinned, non-Christians, some non-Christians are still going to be nicer than us sometimes. There's an illustration in the show, This Is Us. There's a powerful story about the actor Kevin giving up a really important, really high-paying audition because his brother has received some horrible news and has collapsed in the floor. And Kevin chose to sit with his brother and hold him during his time of need and gave up his goal, his dream. And I don't know about you, but I could see that happening in real life. I think we've done that for one another at one point or another. Would you do that for your sibling or your best friend? I know that there's a lot of Christians out there who wouldn't make that type of sacrifice for a family member. No, I said Christian. There are Christians that wouldn't do that. Or a friend or anybody else. The idea never occurs to them. So I'm going to compare, if I'm going to compare my righteousness to someone else's, even a non-Christian's, there's still going to be times that you or I will not measure up. At least I won't. And there are going to be times when non-Christian people will be more righteous than we are. I readily admit that I know my righteousness will not measure up. And the second reason is that we've got to be careful using our righteousness as the standard for right and wrong with people because our righteousness does not compare to God's. Romans 3.19 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be accountable to God. God is righteous and his law, which is called the law of Moses, is a description of God's righteousness. We need to remember that God's law is the gold standard, not ours. And his law is the benchmark of all that is good and righteous. Our righteousness is not the yardstick by which righteousness is measured. When we measure our righteousness against God's, our first scripture lesson this morning that JT read and Isaiah 64, 6 says, We are all like an unclean thing. And all of our righteousness are like a filthy rag. We all fade as a leaf, and our inequities like the wind have taken us away. If I compare my righteousness to somebody else's, I might look a little cleaner than like an axe murderer. You know, hopefully I would be better than someone I picked up on the street, but I have been known to drive fast down 55 just a few times but you might look a little cleaner than me and if you or I compare our righteousness with God's we're all going to look pretty dingy so comparing our righteousness to those that don't come to church or that are not Christians is foolish and biblically, it says that in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, it basically says that if we compare ourselves to others, we show that we are not smart. God doesn't want us to be holier than thou. He wants us to be humbler. And he wants us to recognize that we did not earn our salvation. It was a gift. And that points to the second advantage that we Christians have over non-Christians. We did not earn our salvation. This was paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, just like everybody else. This is us. Just like everybody else, if it weren't for the grace of God, we would all die for our sins and go to hell. This is us. But our advantage over those outside of Christ is that we realized 
that we couldn't make it on our own. One poet said it this way, he paid a debt he did not owe, I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. The people you or I look down on are just like us. Except they haven't found Jesus yet. And I think that that might be our problem. It's our job. Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission, that is what we are supposed to do, is to go to other countries, all nations, and spread the word of God. That's our job. We're not supposed to put them down. We're supposed to bring them back up. Romans 3, 23 through 25 tells us again, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Make a note of that word. It's at the top of your bulletin under topic today. Essentially, this passage that we just read is telling us that it's the blood of Jesus Christ and not our righteous deeds that allow us to be saved. It is not earned. It is a gift that we received because of our faith. Now stay with me on this because this is a really important part now. Have you sinned? Take a good hard look at yourself. Have you sinned? Do you think I've sinned? How, it's only noon. <laughs> um, of course we have. God said it and it must be true. And the unique thing is, is that God tells us about sin that it's just like going to work. Okay, you get a wage for working. You get paid by the hour. You get a wage for going to work and doing your job. You get a wage for sinning. Do you know what the wages of sin are? Death, that's right. So Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. And that is scary. But the law of Moses, which is what? The Ten Commandments is the law of Moses, declared that every sin is to be punishable by death. According to the law of Moses in the Old Testament, it says all of us deserve to die because we've, we've sinned. And that's where it gets good here, because this word propitiation, it's a $20 word, but what does it mean? It means that I'm studying a lot these days, and so I'll save this for you, what I've studied, that in Romans 3... It's translated from a Greek word called mercy seat in Hebrews 9.5. Hebrews 9 tells about this Ark of the Covenant. Um, it was covered on all sides with gold, and it had a golden urn holding manna, which was bread that fell from the sky, and Aaron's staff was budded, and the, ta the tablets of the covenant or the Ten Commandments. And above all, the angels of the glory overshadowed this mercy seat. And the lid on this seat had blood on it. And this is the mercy seat of the ark. It had a little lid on it, and it had blood on it. And once a year, a high priest back then would come to the Holy of Holies and sprinkle blood of an innocent sacrifice on this mercy seat. And that blood was to cover the sins of the people for the previous year because they wouldn't die of their sins. So now the lid is pushed back and can you see something inside the Ark of the Covenant? And it's the law of Moses. It's the Ten Commandments. In it is the law of God that decreed death upon all sinners. Do you know what would happen if someone were to look inside of that lid of the law. A couple different biblical examples, and I don't have time to go through them, but 1 Samuel 6, 19, they died. When you looked in and you saw that, you died. 1 Samuel 6, 19 says that when the ark came to a village named Bathsheba, some of the folks got curious and they looked inside of it, and God struck them down, some of the men of Bathsheba, putting 70 of them to death because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. 
Same thing happened, 1 Chronicles 13, 10. The law was so poignant and fatal that just touching the Ark of the Covenant could bring death. A young man named Uzzah touched the side of the Ark and were told that God struck him down because he put his hand to the Ark and died there before God. The Ark of the Covenant was a objective lesson to the Israelites back then, and it's a lesson to us too. That every sinner should die. All of the Israelites had sinned, and therefore they deserved to die, just like we do. But on top of the law, covering the law, was the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was covered by blood, right? So, just like the mercy seat of old, the blood of Jesus Christ covers our sins so that we won't die for ours when we mess up. We're just like everybody else. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We deserve to die. We all do. But for Christians, the blood of Jesus Christ covered our sins and broke the power of the law and its condemnation. As Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, And there is now, there now for no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. It is because of our sins that Jesus was there in the first place. It is our fault that Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood for us. We didn't force him to die there. He willingly went. But it was for our sins that Jesus Christ went to the cross. If you look in your pews, I'm going to close. There's a piece of paper there with a painting on it. And I think we only put one or two in each row. But just for you to look at, this is a painting by a famous artist by the name of Rembrandt. And it's called The Raising of the Cross, painted in 1633. And it's a beautiful painting, but it's an odd one. Because you see this man in the blue beret that's at the bottom of the cross. And he looks like he's nailing the nails in Jesus' feet on the cross. That is Rembrandt. He painted a picture of himself at Jesus' feet. Why in the world would he do that? And the reason is, is that it looks like he's nailing the nails in. And he does that because he wanted us to know that he knew the truth. He knew it. He was guilty of sin. And Jesus was dying for his guilt and shame. Jesus was dying for Rembrandt, and this is us, because Jesus died for us as well. And let me tell you something, this morning, I don't want to scare you, and I just want you to know, when you accept the truth, and you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you repent of your sins, and you confess that, and allow ourselves to be buried in the waters of baptism, and you rise up a new creature in Christ. The blood of Jesus covers your sins too. And defeats the power of the law forever. At many funerals, this verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 57 is stated, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But... Thanks be to God, who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is because of that verse, it is because of that act, it is because of what Jesus did for us to spread his blood on our mercy seat that makes us, this is us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we try to grasp hold of every security in this life, to live one of peace and prosperity, love and happiness, good health and no pain. We get our advanced degrees and we our high-paying jobs and sit in our plush offices and give to the needy. And we sometimes look down on those that don't have what we have, that don't believe what we do, whose sins are the hot topic of our water cooler conversations and yet we still call ourselves Christians and thanks be to God that we are for not everything that we have done but for whatever you did and what you sent your son to do 
forgives us for that. His blood is our saving grace. And this morning, through our regrets and our tears and our guilt and our hope, we humbly ask your forgiveness in the ways in which we are not like you. Open our eyes and our hearts this morning to the many ways in which you speak to us. Amen. At the end of each service, we do give a time of invitation and reflection. And this is essentially your time to answer God's message, to answer what he has told you this morning. Maybe you're ready to find Jesus in victory as well. Or maybe you have been visiting Haymarket Baptist Church and you're ready to come in and be part of our church family. Whatever the decision on your heart this, in this day, Dr. Olson will be here at the front to accept any and all who may come. Let us stand together and sing our hymn confidently and proudly in this day. Hymn number 499, Victory in Jesus Because We Have It. Let us stand together.
death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Bow with me as we close. Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross, that all of us who are sinners might be saved. We rejoice with that grace today. Let us share that grace with others as we leave in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.